You're listening to St. Pete X Season 2. Today's episode is brought to you by CapEx Advisory Group. When organizations undertake large capital or real estate projects, they turn to CapEx for additional resources and expertise. To learn what an owner's rep can do for you, visit CapEx's website at ceag2.com. That's C-E-A-G, the number two, dot com. And by the Open Partnership Education Network, located at the University of South Florida in St. Petersburg. The world is open for citizens, businesses, groups, for all of us to become a smarter, better connected city by learning together. To find out more about Open, including upcoming great Arresty speakers, please visit learnopen.org. Now enjoy the conversation. Joining me on SPX today is, we'll say, local class legend, (laughs) Duncan McClellan. Welcome, sir. Hi, how are you? Doing well, doing well. So first, Props on, on a beautiful gallery. You've made a, a great space there. You moved into an area before it was as hot as it is now and played no small part in making that place Who as knew? hot as it is now. Who knew? <laughs> Maybe you did. Well, kind of. If, if I had known more, I would have purchased more around <laughs> all me of the, all of the had I had more money. But it has been a real interesting 10-year journey. Let's just dive into that. When you were looking to open a gallery... What were you looking for? What other places did you consider and why did you ultimately choose that location? Well, I think a lot of artists can relate this. The first thing I was looking for was an honest gallery. You know, the typical artist, and I deal with a few that are terrific. But then there's other galleries that don't take care of the artists as well or their end of the bargain. And having experienced that just two weeks prior from two galleries, I decided it was time to open my own. So you were actually driven by necessity just to have a fair gallery experience to to open your own. All right. So then when you actually thought about that gallery at that time, how did you envision it? How were you deciding which location in the city to choose? Why did you choose St. Pete at all? Well, first of all, I tried to do this idea in Tampa, but I wasn't getting the governance getting behind it as much as I needed them wasn't looking for financial help. I was looking for allowing things to happen. And over here, we had a governance that really cared about it, particularly at the time, Leslie Curran, who owns a great gallery here in town, and Jeff Danner. And they got behind the effort of the arts. And I wanted a particular place because we are a collection of all the things that we've done in the past and that we like doing. So I wanted to be a farmer. I wanted to be a restaurateur. I wanted to have a gallery. I wanted to help other artists in the path. And it took about two years, even over here looking, that I found the particular type of building I was looking for. What I wanted is a building that looked like a church. Mm. I wanted it to be that experience when the doors open and you're seeing all this well-lit glass, and it's incredible, the artists that we are lucky enough to represent, that it kind of gives that wow experience. And I would like to say that there was a total master plan. It's evolved. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I'm really proud of what we're becoming and what we have done already. So churches have a wow factor they have throughout history, but the wow factor is meant to tie to something bigger philosophically. Can you dig into what the the philosophy behind the wow factor of, of art is for you? Well, the reason I got into glass, even though I've had previous experience in other mediums, was that I was so interested in seeing what these people were doing. I had no knowledge of it. So I wanted to learn not expecting to be a glass artist. Mm -hmm. I remember my teacher, John Brecky, who I felt was not as represented as he should have been for the incredible work that he does, the content, the technical expertise. And I wanted to find out more so that I could help him sell his work. And then seeing all this other work from artists, very exciting. And it's more from uh, ignorance that I wanted to get more knowledge about glass itself. Hmm. Well, let me phrase it a different way. What do you see in glass that makes it a special medium? And what do you think most people don't see in glass that they should? 
Well, what I like about glass is that it can be approached from every angle, from a four-year-old just loving that blue cobalt color to a more concentrated quest of looking at what that artist was trying to say or what the viewer gets out of that. And many media can do that. What I like about glass is that it's so versatile. It can be translucent. It can be opaque. It can be hard. It can be looking like it's just the softest thing. And there's so many things about glass that you can never probably get to a point where you can say, I've made a perfect piece. Even though we have many examples of what I think are perfect pieces. And of course, I'm, that's all relative and subjective right. to, to, at the end of the day. How much do you get into the, the science of glass, the you know, understanding it at a you know, molecular level? It's very interesting to me, but there's uh, artists that we bring in, such as the guys from MIT that take it to the nth degree, <laughs> that they are really working on the science of glass. I approach it in a more basic way. Right. So having gone through a couple of different medium, you had leather, clay, even some working candles. Oh, I, <laughs> or, I've been making things since I was 14 and selling them in boutiques and stores. I had a line of leather belts when I was a kid that we sold to five different boutiques, then got into during the Carnaby days before your time and uh, made candles and got into clay. My mother was a potter. But it wasn't as satisfying. And then, luckily, I had the opportunity to try glass. Right. But there were really no places here to blow glass. So I would have to fly to New York. Wow. Uh, I found the New York Experimental and found some teachers up there. That's why it's so important, I think, to have a hot shop, a professional hot shop, not only that people can work out of, but that we can demonstrate to the public and get that excitement, but also the knowledge base. It's really important that the person that is purchasing a piece has a true understanding of how it's made. I think that's half of the enjoyment. Mm. So did you choose glass or did glass become the central medium in your life because of success that you had with glass? I mean, if it had, had your clay work taken off, could we be just as easily sitting here no. talking about clay glass you chose I, glass. I was successful in clay right but i went on to other means of sustaining myself work for a circus i had retail stores at the tampa airport ran restaurants went to restaurant school what captured me was the material itself and the people around it those two things yeah that's interesting because there's a few things it looks like you've you've done out of sort of pragmatism you know you had a bad gallery experience so you opened a gallery you got into glass helping somebody else be appreciated for their glass. And you also started a hot shop because people needed a hot shop, right? So there's a lot of uh, interesting pragmatism in what's driven some of your decisions. Let's go back to that. Can you talk about the bad experience you had with that gallery? And is that indicative of galleries? Um, and what is that sort of relationship? No, it's not indicative of good galleries. Right. There are agreements that are pretty basic. Mm -hmm. Of course, we have a contract with artists, but it's all based on a handshake because the paper is worthless unless we follow through. And it was that experience that led me to believe that there was a better way because I sustained myself for many years doing outdoor fairs. Part of our DMG school project, for an example, we just started a emerging artists in residency on Monday. And part of their six-week training will be mentoring them on pricing and where to show the work and what to expect out of galleries and what is expected out of them to hold up their side of the bargain. Mm. There's a whole set of ethics that are really important. And if an artist kind of bends those rules, it makes it very difficult to represent them. Luckily, we have ethical and wonderful artists to work with. That's sort of been a, an imbalance in a lot of different places throughout time is whether it's the record company taking advantage of the band who doesn't have the acumen or the gallery owner who obviously has business acumen, you know, and putting a, an artist in a non-advantageous position. So can you share some of the, especially I'm interested in the pricing. So how, how do you talk about artists about how to price their work? Well, uh, for an example, the standard with 
all galleries is it's a 50 50 deal right a gallery needs to provide for their percentage because the way i see it glass is a very expensive medium to work in and in reality the average glass artist whether they're emerging or top of their game are really making about 15 20 percent they're not getting rich right and they also if you can compare it to a painting they are weaving their canvas Mm -hmm. (laughs) if their canvas has any flaw it's thrown out it's not painted over so there's less output from a glass artist than there would be or could be from artists in other mediums and then what a gallery should do is if there's any offering of free shipping or a discount on that piece or taking care of the client costs money. Mm-hmm. You know, every opening on a weekend, we're spending almost $10,000. So there has to be a return. Right. But that is incumbent on the gallery, not on the artist. The artist did their job. When they get it to a gallery, it's then the gallery's job to take over, make that sale and provide communication with the artist to let them know the same day, hey, we sold this piece. So all the expenses leading up to delivering the piece to the gallery belong to the artist and all the expenses of selling the piece after it's in the gallery belong to the gallery. That's the way it should be. And when it's done that way, it's very fair because that's about what a gallery ends up with, the same percentage as the artist. Right. But what about the overall asking price? How do you start to build what that is, whether it's a $10,000 or 20,000. I mean, you touched on some thinking that's more, you know, traditional cost of inputs, right? But obviously art, the value of art is in the vision and the execution, not the cost of the input. So that's a softer area of pricing and intangible value. So how, how do you talk to them about figuring that out? Well, that comes in last in the equation because like we do a lot of school kids coming through. And the first question they ask is, do you get burned? Second question is, Why does that cost $10,000? And you show them it's algebra, Mm -hmm. that it's a formula that every artist works it out for themselves, whether they know it's algebra or not. Adding up the costs, the final number of output of pieces, and they put a price on their life, Mm -hmm. on what it costs them to create that work. And most artists are really just They're looking to stay in the life. That's the main central theme for each artist. And what we don't do is weigh in on the price. Interesting. The only time I'll weigh in on the price, say I have the advantage in the fact that I've worked in the medium. Right. So we don't have somebody coming in with a broken light bulb saying that that's $10,000. Right. I know better. Yeah. I will tell you that it's very few times in my career Have we said, you know what? I like the work. It's not worth that much money. I won't carry it. So that's my criteria that I have for the gallery. I can walk you through my gallery and I can defend every price on those pieces because I know what that artist went through. Now, yes, an artist does add certain amount of money, which is their due on, yes, I'm in 20 major museums. There is a demand for my work, but it's uh, the same that any business goes through. So, you know, for me, and this is my perspective, and this could be completely wrong, you know, I see the the input cost and the time as taking it up to a certain level, but then I see the big swings up and down in value going outside of those, you know, more into the intangible world. So, like I would say, if you told me that I could take one piece, put it into a nice gallery in Miami and South Beach or wherever the galleries are there and put $30,000 on it and then take that same piece and take it to more of a, you know, touristy gallery or a, or whatever, a smaller market, we'll just say, and put that same piece out there for $1,200 that it may sell five times for $30,000 in that environment and not sell once for $1,200 in the other environment. That doesn't happen too often in glass. First of all, there's an association of glass collectors worldwide which kind of (laughs) doesn't control the pricing, but you're not going to get away with it. That's the one thing that I demand out of my artists, that if this piece is $8,000 in XYZ gallery, it's $8,000 here, not $9,000, not $7,000. That's a strategy for making the market, right? 
you know, that's a strategy for pricing consistency to keep the optics of the market pure, right? So people can trust that the value is there because everywhere they look, it's that same value, exactly. but it's still you deciding that, right? So you're making the market or suggesting it. I wouldn't say well, the that. artist yeah. decides the pricing. The only time that we weigh in on a pricing and typically it's an emerging artist right. that really doesn't have a clue and they're way under pricing well, what that piece should sell for. And I didn't mean choosing the price. I meant choosing the consistency, Oh, pushing okay. for the consistency. Yeah. And so that shows a wisdom to keeping the market healthy, right? So that people say that, okay, I'm seeing this value. I used to sell music collectibles for a band that there wasn't really a market for. It. And this was also partly because this was when the internet was emerging. And I became the first place where anybody in the country could go and see collectibles for this band. And, you know, I essentially went through the process of making that market. I sort of had a judge of what I thought was rare, what I had trouble because I would spend my Sundays looking up record stores right. around the country and you calling did your them homework and saying, hey, do you have any of these in stock? Because nobody knew at that time what they were worth. So, you know, they may have an album in their normal bin for $7.99 that I knew I could sell for $500. But because the market wasn't there and that, that sort of centralized pricing mechanism wasn't there, I could find those anomalies and stuff. And so, you know, I scooped up and of course, eBay and, and the internet changed all that because that's essentially what it did. It put pricing out there to the world, but it doesn't, you know, it's still, even though it's now easier to do that, but you're still making the market, right? You're still the leading people in the market are setting the top end of the price range in sort of a symbiotic relationship with the art collectors because it's actually in their best interest for the value of the stuff to go up too. And then that trickles down to all the other levels of art. I see it as an equilateral triangle between the gallery, the artist, and the collector. Right. And when it changes shape and it goes to another form of a triangle, mm -hmm. that's where the problem is. And every gallery has to have a set of ethics of that, even though I think this is underpriced, I'm not going to raise it and keep that differential. Right. If we talk to the artist and say to him or her, look, you just worked a whole month on a piece. You're only paying yourself $300. Right. You know, you can't live on that. Right. So we do adjust them up, but we don't adjust them to the fair value right away because you got to build that market. Right. So a very smart artist that we represent, typically his work is incredible demand, but he didn't double and triple his prices. Right. What he does is he, every year, they go up about 10 to 12%. Good return. And that's enough to get that person that was looking last year to go, I better buy it. Right. It gives him more money that he's finally getting to a point where it's more equitable in the amount of work that he does for what he receives for it. Right. But he's earned that right by getting not only better but getting the word out on his work over and above what a gallerist does for him. So with that equilateral triangle, if it skews, who usually drives the skew? Is it usually the gallery that tries to drive the skew? It depends. I think there's equal blame <laughs> and equal kudos to all three sides of those. You know, if a client wants to beat you up on a price, right. it doesn't work because then the gallery goes out of business in our case, the artist would get the same amount, right. but I'll go out of business. Right. So I won't be bringing the emerging artist to keep the interest going. So ultimately the collector loses. Right. And do you really want to buy something that you just devalued? You know, if an artist doesn't keep the pricing consistent and he's all over the map, he might have a few collectors, but he's not going to have the galleries. And if the gallery ends up not being fair to the collectors and taking care of them right. and not taking care of the artists, they're going to collapse, but so will those other two entities. And you used the word kudos too, which was interesting because I, I did imagine a scenario, you know, if you assume that the gallery breaks the triangle strategically by raising the prices, as, you know, the buyers are kind of the litmus test. If they go for it, then all of a sudden you know, that's how you sometimes get to a bigger triangle, right? Well, yeah, but see, we're not the ones that are pushing the triangle. Right. I let the artist tell me, no, we're raising the price or this is a new body of work and it was this much more effort or it's this point in my career. We are not the driver of that price. But the gallery may be. 
No, not the gallery. Oh, the gallery won't. Sorry, sorry. No. You're saying we as the gallery. I'm, uh, I'm saying the gallery. artist. It's schizophrenic here because <laughs> okay, yeah, I'm an you're both, artist, yeah. a gallerist, <laughs> and a, buyer, and a collector. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why I see it as the equilateral triangle. You know, it's a neat market because essentially everybody has an incentive for it to get better, right? So it, it's just that who does it first, you know, who's willing to go up a little bit or do a little more. And then, but the whole thing grows because everybody wins when it grows. I think it's got to come from the artist first. Yeah. You know, I go back to the fact that there's so much of that intangible stuff. That's what's so interesting about art because personality can make someone's art more attractive and a story makes an art so much more attractive. And, you know, me, you know, I approach things probably more from the branding first coming from a marketing background or whatever. And so the number of levers and the possibilities that would almost be oppressively expansive in how many different things you could do or be. And ultimately it needs to be authentic, but you know, where do you draw the line between awareness of how your actions drives your art prices and how your, you know, your brand and your story and your, you know, your interaction with the community, obviously, you know, this, you've been a big steward of the community. Yeah. You've seen it. You've lived it because of how you've interacted and what you've given to the community has come back to you in success that you've seen, in addition to the quality of your work, obviously. Well, I think keeping that quality up is absolutely important and supporting the other aspects, the collectors and the artists themselves. But ultimately, it's the artist that drives that, and we want to support that. It's part of our whole training in the gallery for these emerging artists is talking about those same things. How much of that is the perfect balance? A lot of this is driven by necessity, but what's the balance that an artist should have of that knowledge themselves and be responsible for? And then where does it start to detract from their art and they need somebody else? I think of like an athlete, right? Right. They're not negotiating their own contracts. They're not out there looking for their own deals with the shoe companies or whatever. They are conscious of their brand, but a lot of times they'll bring in help with their brand. They'll bring in PR, they'll bring in marketing. They'll bring in an agent to to negotiate the contracts and they have this sort of, you know, it's clear to them that their responsibility is to be in game shape and kick ass out on the field. That's their job. Right. But with a lot of artists, you know, and I guess the difference is, is that you don't have that opportunity for small athletes, but you do have that opportunity to some extent for small artists to sell, you know, how much of that should be in them. And at what point then should the art infrastructure come in and say, we'll take care of your branding. We'll take care of your contracts. You know, we'll take care of some of these things. Well, I think there's a danger in letting, first of all, not having the knowledge and letting somebody else tell you we're your savior. I've always run away from people that say we're going to save you. <laughs> and for the artists, even the most established artists that we represent, they are excellent marketers. In most cases, they probably don't need me at all. <laughs> They're doing me the favor by allowing us to represent them because they can't be everywhere at once. Right. For an example, when I was doing outdoor shows, I happen to like Midwesterners a lot. Is Some That's of my best like. friendships, <laughs> some of my closest collectors and artist friends came from doing that. And so it was the other coasts that I knew I wasn't going to travel to that I could get my pieces out mm-hmm. and they can sell them. And it would help me in the Midwest because they'd be in San Francisco, for an example, Mm -hmm. and see one of my pieces. It just elevated their appreciation of my work just in the locale. I mean, part of that is marketing. Mm -hmm. So I really think every artist needs to wear every hat, the accounting hat, the marketing hat, the making hat. And in glass, it's not a one-man band. So management skills are really important. I hope by the end of my life that I become a good manager. (laughs) And I think all my employees would agree. (laughs) I think they have to have the basics. Now, as they get bigger Mm -hmm. and as their operations get bigger, uh, i.e. a Chihuly, they can't do everything. And they're not good at everything. They can't be. But they can hire the people that can help them. But I think if Mr. Chihuly didn't have a good command of marketing when he first started, he wouldn't be where he is now. You know, he was able to think out of the box and take it to a completely different level. Right. And so always artists need to be marketing and handling a lot of that themselves. 
and to make sure that it's being done in the method that they agree with. Right. So this is sort of asking the same question again, but I, I'd just be interested to go this way with it. Do you think that there are artists who are equally talented as Chihuly and who are equally as innovative and, you know, do a lot of the same things that he has done and never get anywhere? And if you were, could assume that that's true, what would be the main reasons why? Saying that two artists are equal and... There's a Chihuly clone out there, slightly different, so it's right, not the but same. but without art. the marketing skills and everything else. What are the skills that, you know, is that if you have two people as talented as Chihuly and one becomes Chihuly and one becomes, you know, managing a Hertz rent-a-car, why did that happen? Real easy, show up. Showing up matters. Creating those connections with other people. And being interested in other people, not for what you're going to get out of it, but expanding your, your knowledge base. Does that answer your question? Well, so does that mean it's clever exposure? I mean, you mentioned the fact that, you know, the Midwesterners see your piece in San Francisco. So it's sort of by triangulating your pieces, if they get multiple inputs, like in the marketing world, you say, you want people to see you three times, right? Yeah, the branding. If they see you here once, they see you here a second time, a friend mentions you, you're in a good spot, right? right. You got a good shot of getting them. And so, you know, you kind of said a similar version that they saw you at the, at the outdoor thing. They saw you had a piece in San Francisco, saw you at the gallery online or whatever. And all of a sudden you've got something going there. And then, you know, the network effect kicks in and, and they tell somebody and so on and so forth. And so when you say showing up, is that part of being a participant in the community? Yes. Because if you're a recluse, how is anybody going to know about what you do unless somebody else is doing that for you? But Again, I do think that every artist needs to have a certain amount of that skill. And yes, you can take one artist that is particularly good at showing up right. and engaging the public and that type of thing and actually sell more work than another artist that could be much more talented because he or she isn't getting the word out on what they're doing. Right. So it's almost like you have to set a basic leveling of, you know, they're going to be talented. You know, they're going to be personable. They're going to have these basic skills. Those people all get to one level. And then really, ideally, the talent is what takes them then to the next level with all right. those basics in place. It gives them a stage. They've created a stage for themselves. You know, and then I look back historically, and this is where I, I kind of said before how the opportunities kind of can be mind-blowingly expansive is, you know, I've always been a fan of the Beats, right? And, and the, you know, Kerouac and Ginsburg. And, and I was a Hunter S. Thompson guy. Hunter S. Thompson was not liked by the people who were around him at the time. He was difficult to work with not a good friend. And then to some extent, even, you know, some of the writers were odd and some were reclusive. Pollock. Yes, exactly. <laughs> right. But the stories that are told about them is what makes it, you know, it's that writer, you know, there's the electric Kool-Aid acid test and there's, you know, on the road and these people were made, you know, legends by the stories that were told about them. You know, the romantic Dylan playing at a Soho cafe or Ferlin Getty showing up at a City Lights bookstore and the way those stories were told. So then, you know, knowing that in the marketing world, you can manufacture that, right? And then feed that back into the fact that you had mentioned earlier that, you know, the limited editions, how many pieces you made, you know, it's just like a manufactured rarity in there as well. So all of this stuff, you can look historically of how all this stuff has worked and you can deconstruct it. And if you have the right mindset, you can do it. And follow the plan. Yeah, and follow the plan, yeah. With what fits your personality best. With what fits, yeah. You know, mine has always been being short. Uh, <laughs> I'm loud, uh, you know, and I don't mind doing that. Yeah. And uh, that's part of my fun, too. Yeah. Well, I mean, all the best, you know, Tonner S. Thompson, you know, for whatever he was, glass is probably not as controversial of a, a medium as, like, music. Right. Marilyn Manson, first example that comes to mind, is kind of, you know, unless he does a massive rebranding, it's kind of trapped by being right. Marilyn Manson forever. Are you trapped by being short and louder? <laughs> you no. Know? <laughs> it's what they expect, but I'm also 64. Yeah. So how much more time am I going to have to change that persona? If you show up at an event and decide to sit quietly and demurely in the corner. I don't get that opportunity. You don't get it. No. You're forced. See, yeah. Yeah, you're trapped. Then. <laughs> I hide sometimes when we have our opening uh, for a little bit, just to have a little bit of peace for a minute. So let's get into St. Pete a little bit. St. Pete has... I think I'm sure to your joy become a Mecca for glass and you play no small part in that. Tell me your feelings about St. Pete's place in the world as in the glass world. What is amazing to see how this synergy has been created and what we've been able to attract. I mean, we just attracted an international conference, mm -hmm. which is pretty astounding when last year it was in Murano and 
Next year, it's in Sweden. Mm -hmm. St. Pete is growing up. And again, it goes back to the governance. Mm -hmm. In some cases, the governance allowed things to happen. For an example, in my neighborhood, I get to live, work, and show. Mm -hmm. That is huge. Been talking to other communities about you want to revitalize an area and make it go from a dangerous area to a cool area that houses went from 19,000 to 450,000 in five years. You want the tax base to go up, then allow for certain things to happen, and then have a long enough range of time to not allow other businesses to come in that will ruin that nucleus of what you're building to bring the tax base up even higher right. because you'll price out the artist. You will lose the cool thing that made that neighborhood safe. Right. I can point to Ebor. Right. It went from where I worked as an artist, pretty derelict, but eh, relatively safe to where it became nightclubs. Right. And it definitely went downhill from there. I mean, just looking at the amount of police they have to have versus the amount of police they had prior to art coming up, became cool, nightclubs moved in, yeah. and then it went down. So that's not a classic example, really, of gentrification. That's more of they used a vibe to bring in a business style that killed the vibe. They allowed a business. I'm not blaming governance in particular, but they allowed developers to do it. For an example, I'm dead set against that in our neighborhood. Right. And then sometimes you, <laughs> for an example, I was against breweries. Really? I was wrong. Yeah. They are craftsmen. Uh -huh. They have a place in the Warehouse Arts District, a very important place. And it was kind of funny because I was having a meeting about me being adamant that, no, I don't want to see this in my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. I decided to go to a brewery, and I saw that I was completely wrong, mm. that this was not 10 beers for $10. Okay. The only difference was the demographics were a bit younger, and they were appreciating the beer just as someone in a wine bar would appreciate a glass of wine. But I would be dead set against nightclubs moving into our area, because I think that changes the element right. and the thought process of what that neighborhood's about. Okay, so you know when I go back to the gentrification, you know traditional definition of it, nightclubs changes the vibe. What about these, you know, twelve, fifteen, twenty story condos that are, you know, four hundred thousand dollars for a one bedroom? Well, for an example, I would love to see more of that in other neighborhoods <laughs> than mine. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> uh, there is such a need worldwide, not just the United States, right. for workforce housing. Yes, I see it with my employees. But there's places for that that can be on the edges of this. But if you ruin that initial thrust, mm -hmm. you'll be able to have it grow over 10, 15 years. But the rest of the time, you're going to be fighting the elements that came in. Whereas if you have a 100-year view, St. Petersburg is going to be known for the city of the arts for many, many years, as long as they run it right. Right. So it's interesting. So the key, what you're really bringing out here is that you have to let it incubate long enough to really put its roots in. Exactly. Yes. Okay. And allow ownership. Right. And sort of gentrification over in the long term is somewhat inevitable, but if you do it right, you can at least gentrify in a way that doesn't kill the character. Well said. Okay. <laughs> you're pointing at me and smiling, but you can't hear that on a, you can't hear that on a podcast. So. Well, I got to tell <laughs> yeah. you, that's well yeah. said because okay. they could kill it. Right. I don't think they will. I think that because they have done things that, uh, like the live work show, right. which are brilliant. You got to follow codes. That's absolutely mandatory, but you can allow for things to happen and not try to regulate every square inch right? because artists do need the freedom to be able to do some of that to make it a cool place. Again, just it's one of those levers where it's like, if you make it cool, but in a slightly unattractive way, you know, <laughs> you'll stave off because the cooler you make it, the sooner the $450,000 condos get there. You know, that's just, um, and there's a speed to that. And if you can keep the grunginess as long as possible, and again, that sort of incubation period, you know, then you have the best chance of putting the deepest roots in so that you can be a city of the arts for, you know, when, then you eventually get to that point where you're busing the starving artists over to the 10 beers for $10 back to their affordable housing. It's like 40 minutes on the bus. But you can attract, I mean, I have a neighbor that is 
doing a large project there, all based on arts and entertainment. Right. Daddy Cool's moving there, mm-hmm. which is really great. I mean, it's everything I wanted to see. So it's getting the right-minded developers, right. right-minded governance to be able to keep it that targeted so that 100 years from now, people coming to St. Pete, do you know that 20.3% of the visitors to St. Pete come here to go to some cultural event, whether it be music or museums or art galleries or art festivals or whatever? And the city is coming up, so I'm very grateful for what they're doing. But there was a time period where we were getting very little money, if any, for the arts. And we were getting a reputation as an arts town. Well, you got to support that. And I think they're really trying on a state level. They need to (laughs) certainly try under Governor Scott. Prior to Governor Scott, cultural institutions got to share $200 million uh, across the state. That fund is now $2 million. So it's very difficult for the museums in particular to sustain all their outreach, all the free things they do in a community when they don't have that income. It's really tough on them. I always find that interesting. Museums are aggregators of content, and there are really very few, if any, examples of those entities that can exist without either government or private philanthropic support. There's few that can say, I have this brand I built, I have this art, I charge an admission, like Bush Gardens, right? Bush Gardens can support itself without philanthropy and without government assistance because it, you know, And I don't think there's anybody that doesn't agree that art is vital to a healthy community. So how do we end up in this place where aggregated art in these beautiful buildings isn't self-sustainable? But it's never been sustainable. It always required people stepping in, both government and individuals, to supplement that. Because you mentioned Bush Gardens. Well, it's not $89 to go to the MFA. Right. You know, it's $10. Um, and you get an incredible experience. And so the money has to come somewhere because the amount of costs of bringing in a show and sustaining a show are astronomical. But, you know, if that was the case for a concert and they were going to bring in artist X and that same logic was true, they just wouldn't have the concert, right? right? (laughs) Well, because museums and some of the other institutions, I mean, that's what makes our mark on the world. It needs to be supported from that aspect because not everyone can afford to go to a particular concert, but they can hear it on a radio. But with the museums, they have an important place in our community. Right. And they need to be supported on all levels, whether it's individual level, corporations, and because this is what makes your mark. It's not just making it a nice town to live in. Mm -hmm. This is what makes businesses money to want to move here are those things that the quality of life issues. I mean, that's the conversation always is, is it's as much as we say education is important. If we didn't educate people, they wouldn't have the skills to be in the workforce to drive the economy. And art is just an equally valuable piece of that whole engine. Yeah. It's not an add on. It's not a fringe. It's part of the fabric. Yeah. It's really important that people understand how important it is to their job, even though they're not related to it, that a visitor here or that you attend and you support the museums, not just by donating money, but showing up. Right. So we're doing great in St. Pete. What can we do better? Advertise it more nationally for an example. I opened up a Wall Street Journal today and there was a quarter page ad talking about Texas and the arts. It was showing a mural. It was showing a woman shopping. But that instant picture, it's that kind of support. There's a tremendous amount of money that comes in with the bed tax money. Mm -hmm. And I've been really working hard to put my voice in that when they're advertising the arts and they put a one-inch square of image of the Dali Mm -hmm. and maybe a one-inch square of the Chihuly collection in that, that's not telling the world that St. Pete has art. It's not making it the arts destination. For an example, 
when we had the VP scare of the oil. The beaches lost a tremendous amount of business, 30 and 40 percent, I think is the figure. Downtown saw a lot less because there were people that were coming here just to go to the Dolly and the MFA and Florida Craft Art, and they were coming here just for that. So it didn't affect them going out to the beach. Mm -hmm. Do we want the tourists to come in and get burned on the beach in three days and then go, why am I here? For the rest of the four days right no we have something to show them yep. and to relieve their sunburn uh <laughs> come downtown <laughs> and i would like to see again jeff danner proposed this i would love to see fast transit from downtown we have something no other city uh, or not many cities have we have a first north and we have a first south from my studio i could be downtown in four and a half minutes I can be out at the beaches in about eight. That's brilliant. Compare us to any other community around us. I mean, do you really like driving across the bridge or <laughs> north on 19? Not really. We have something that could be a mass transit. And what I would really like to see this city get is a cultural center that John Collins, who is such a bargain for the city, mm -hmm. If there could be a cultural center and a conference center combined, mm -hmm. not a convention center, something where we can house 2,000 people. For an example, with the conference that was just here last week, we, that was one of the sticking points where we're going to have enough space to bring the whole conference together for particular events, uh, opening ceremonies, closing ceremonies. And we made it because of the Mahaffey, but we lose business because we don't have that conference center here. Mm. I've been told that hotels were the problem. Well, we're seeing more hotels being built downtown, but we have a bunch out at the beach. So if there is a way to bridge that gap, and Jeff Danner suggested that and has been working on it, getting that mass transit. So now we've just opened up a lot of hotel rooms. Mm -hmm. We've exposed tourists or visitors here, not only to our beaches, but the culture downtown. But what if they had to walk through a cultural center to get to the conference center? Then every entity, every musician, every organization, the dance, Helen French's group, our group, the Chihuly, would have exposure and spaces to teach to have live performances, to do all these other things. So we need the space to do that and the will to make that happen. That's a great idea. And really right now, you know, the land up and down central is still affordable and there's plenty of good big plots. Well, I'm thinking a little bit more, you know, that way. <laughs> the tours, the yeah, morning. <laughs> there's a big parking lot that uh, is filled today, but uh, yes. will it be in seven years? About 82 <laughs> acres worth. That's what we're talking. Yeah. yeah. It feels like that's in the works and the renderings that I've seen uh, that certainly have some conference space. And Well, they're talking conference and they're also talking cultural, Yeah, but they're not talking a combined effort, which I think would end up attracting more money from the bed tax money that could be pulled in, more tax money from the state of Florida, and bring more visitors here to St. Pete. That's a great idea. Well, I've enjoyed the conversation. Thank you. I hope I didn't talk too much. You didn't. <laughs> yeah, thanks. We end each show with a shout out. Someone that's potentially under the radar a little bit, that's doing cool stuff that you want to give some good attention to. Katie Dietz from Florida Craft Art, who has... Uh, incredible demo, uh, dynamo personality, and has really done great things for that organization. And that is the hardest working person I know. I have seen her at seven in the morning breakfast uh, meetings and on the same day, 10 o'clock at night, finishing up where having hit all these different things during the day. So Katie Dietz, I would say the director of Florida craft art. Wonderful. And, and I want to give some appreciation to you, understanding your marketing and business acumen and how you've brought that and really worked hard to give that to other artists in addition to giving them the space, in addition to giving the community a great uh, entity in a cool spot. You've made that place. You had a big part in making that place. 
And I think you're doing everything right. And it's very, very valuable to St. Pete. Thank you. I don't know if we're doing everything right. We're faking it until we're making it. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, too. That's right, too. Thank you, sir. Thank you. You've made it to the end of another great episode. For more SPX, visit stpx.com. Thanks again to our sponsors, CapEx Advisory Group, Build with Confidence. CapEx provides owners representation for the most demanding construction projects. With deep knowledge of design, finance, construction, and public policy, CapEx brings your project to life. CapEx supports your organization with leadership and expertise to reduce cost and ease the burden on your team. Discover what an owner's rep can do for you. Discover CapEx Advisory Group. Visit CEAG2.com. That's C-E-A-G, the number two, dot com. And thanks also again to OPEN, the Open Partnership Education Network, which puts on great events around St. Petersburg, including Arresty Speakers. To see the upcoming calendar of events, visit learnopen.org.